as we look at the future of finance, uh, we look towards automation. Uh, and in our next session, uh, I'm excited to welcome Chris Wells, VP of Solutions at Indico, and, and Jeffrey Brown, a partner at Rebel Group, to talk about how CFOs can unlock the value of IA. I think, you know, Stas, it was great hearing from you. So thank you so much in talking about people do uh, and how created automation. And we're excited to see where it's going. But to your point, we can only um, advance our journeys and provide finance and CFOs more time to do the analysis and strategy if we can leverage all the tools at our disposal uh, and create more opportunity to free up uh, capacity on our finance team. So, uh, Jeffrey, Chris, are you able to join me on screen? Yeah, can you can you see us? We hear us can, okay? and we can hear you just fine. Good. Perfect. Great. Well, I'll... Uh... Sorry, Chris, yeah, I was uh, gonna say, I will leave it to you to kick off the session. Okay, good enough. <laughs> I think all of the awkward stuff is out of the way now. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Wells, uh, I'm with Indico Data. I work um, you know, with uh, a team of ML engineers all the way to our product team uh, and directly with our clients to solve problems that they, they see with unstructured data, documents, images, videos, um, across a, a range of businesses and verticals from, you know, banking back office to, um, to life insurance, property and casualty insurance to shared services across industries. Um, and I'm joined today by Jeff Brown from a real group and Jeff, I'll let you tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Chris. Good day, everybody. I'm Jeff Brown. I'm a partner with the reveal group. A reveal group is a small advisory firm that basically focuses on intelligent automation. We help clients think about how to scale their programs for greater impact, and most importantly, figure out how to build and enhance and expand their internal capabilities. Because our point of view is uh, intelligent automation is a tool that's got to be the core toolkit of a lot of your organizations moving forward. In five to 10 years, you're going to be using these tools just like you use Excel and, and PowerPoint. So. And we team with uh, organizations like Chris's that are leading platforms of the kind of software tools that you guys need to do to, to have that impact. So thanks for making time for us today. Amazing. Um, Jeff, I, I know we want to get to the meat of this conversation, which is really around some of the myths that have cropped up and, and surround intelligent automation and unstructured data. But to lead into that and coming off of what you just said, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the CFO function has changed a lot in the past couple of decades. And I, I would love to hear your thoughts on how it's changed and then, and then more to the point, how CFOs are now starting to plug into technology and, and procurement uh, decisions. Well, I, I think uh, CFOs are play a critical role in this space for two reasons. One, a lot of uh, intelligent automation programs have their birth and starting in the finance and admin functions, uh, whether it's uh, order to cash, procure to pay, those processes are very amenable to using more automated tools and benefit the CFO and his finance and admin team or hers in terms of being able to allow you to do more analysis or proactive things with your lines of business and functions versus spending time generating invoices. So for example, we had a client where it took their team an average of four to five minutes to do an invoice. We could build a bot in six weeks that would do 50 in one minute, right? Um, so you basically get a lot of productivity from things that are just repetitive tasks. So in the whole, and we use the for everybody's familiar with the phrase of transformation of the CFO or transformation of finance, Intelligent automation is a key tool, not the only tool, but a key tool in that. The second reason this is important is because CFOs need to understand the intelligent automation because your lines of businesses and functions, whether it's middle back office or customer facing or risk functions are going to say, hey, we're thinking about using these tools. And your question is, how do I think about the economics? Where do I get the benefits? How much am I spending? What what is the payback ratio? How do I think about that? And so CFOs need to understand this not only for their own business, but they're getting increasingly across their organizations asked to, to help 
allocate the, res the scarce resources to have the biggest financial impact. And so part of what we do and in using tools like Indigo is help people understand and, and accomplish those those tasks that deliver real benefit and a very, very quick payback. Um, not a multi-year kind of thing, but uh, one in terms of weeks and months, depending on the tool and the use case. Yeah, that's great to hear. Quick payback is obviously really important. Um, you touched on a few areas that I, I think are top of mind, shared services, middle and back office, operational you know, roles and processes. What are, what are you seeing out there in terms of um, you know, CFOs and, and businesses generally plugging into customer facing operations uh, with intelligent automation? Well, I think they're increasingly using them because the demand for speed and accuracy is requiring you to, to be able to do that. But I think the biggest one we have now, and everybody's talked about the labor market and increasing and scarcity of skills, I think most CFOs are going through and thinking about where is it that I have really, really scarce resources? So example, you know, dealing with a large hospital chain, nurses time is worth its weight in gold, right? Um, retaining, so any stuff you can take off them that is repetitive so they can be interacting with doctors and patients is worth its weight in gold. Uh, whether it's insurance underwriting or uh, commercial lending underwriters, it takes years to train an underwriter. So last thing you want them to do is be doing paperwork. Customer agents or brokers dealing, trying to sell things to clients. Uh, key people in the supply the supply chain. Um, I mean, go through your organization as a CFO and say, where are the really hard positions to replace? And that's partially where you should think about using intelligent automation because you want to make those people more productive and you want them to be doing stuff that's higher value and they, they, they enjoy uh, to do. So uh, as much as we talk about the process that they start at shared services and tend to move middle and back office and move to customer facing, I think in the last 18 months that's been tipped on its head and people are basically saying, where are my scarce people and where is it hard and how can I make them more productive and enjoy so my retention rates go up and I'm not out there trying to recruit more people and train people. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And we hear it all the time from our clients where it's like, we came in, we wanted to streamline this process and we sort of accidentally made everyone's job a little bit better because the, the boilerplate stuff is done for them and they they focus on the stuff that really requires a human brain to get done. Um, well, I, you know, I think your, your, your tool is a great example of, you know, a lot of contracts and legal documents, law firms have paralegals and new lawyers scanning through, extracting data, putting it into a tracking system. That's not what yeah. those people want to be doing. That's not the highest value, right? If you can basically create something that's that takes a mortgage deed of trust or a contract and extracts all the information. Maybe it's not a hundred percent, but it's enough that then they can just go through and look at the, uh, the exceptions and, or because it's slightly different and then have time to do that. You know, you've got a bunch of uh, people who are much more motivated doing higher, higher value things. So, I mean, uh, the way you guys work with contracts and, you know, and uh, mortgage deeds of trust, especially in the mortgage business, is a great example yeah. of where you take a task that is complicated, but is now within the realms of technology with people who are very, very expensive and specialized talent and hard to recruit and, and yeah. make them significantly more productive. Yep. And, and happier at the end of the day, right? We all want to feel like we're getting more done. Um, you, you use the word complicated. Another thing I see a lot from clients is they come to us with either I want to solve all of my unstructured data problems right now across the organization, or if you can't solve this thing, which is the hardest thing we know about, then there's no value. Um, and we have a lot of back and forth on those things. What, what advice or heuristics or just general guidance do you give to businesses as they're trying to figure out What's the first best thing we should tackle before we before we figure out how to scale across the organization? Well, I think it's um, I'm a, not a fan of tackling the most co complicated first. I think it's like learning a sport, like golf. Learn the basic Same. things, that's the simple things first. Build organizational confidence. One of the reasons why a lot of programs um have failed where people have tried to scale them up is they've tried to do the complicated they've tried to 
ride the unicycle, play the harmonica, and do the skewers of fire all concurrently, rather than saying, hey, there's value. Yeah, maybe there's not as much value, but and that builds confidence. It also teaches capability, and then you can scale from to that. So I'm we're big fans of getting people to knock over things that may not have massive uh, uh, value numbers. But the interesting thing is you, if you look at different technologies, whether they're RPA or uh, intelligent document processing or what you guys are in an unstructured, RPA started earlier. It's moving down the curve in terms of cost effectiveness now. Most of my clients can automate something where it is uh, the payback ratio is well under 12 months. So if we started it in January, it's accretive as a CFO within the same year. Um, yep. Structured and semi-structured platforms with handwriting are almost at that point. You guys with yours aren't far, far away, right? So you don't, it's not like back when IBM first launched Watson, where you had to spend millions and millions of dollars, hire a bunch of NASA equivalent engineers, and wait for 18 months for them to solve the complex natures of the universe, right? You can, the, your platform and other platforms in RPA are designed to very quickly stand up um, on infrastructure and go after simple use cases and build that com skills and confidence of the organization. And it helps people understand what to identify uh, to do that, right? So that, that, that would be our, our view on how people to, to do that. And the question with every organization is, every organization is somewhere different on that, that curve. Some are just starting, some have gotten to a point where they've done a few and then they've kind of stalled out because they can't figure out how to scale the next set of opportunities. So it's it's yeah. it's an interesting journey in building both opportunities and capabilities. 100%, yeah. I, we, we don't see the technology necessarily as the biggest accelerant to that payback period. It's really organizational readiness in our experience. Like, do you have the right people talking to the right, you know, the right uh, organizations within the company? Is everyone sharing the right information and, and are they ready to go? Um, yeah, that's a great point. All right, let's talk about some myths about uh, intelligent automation and unstructured data. Um, the first one, which is uh, which I think is a great lead in here, there's this myth that unstructured data is trapped, and you just you're not, it's not viable for being extracted using technology. And um, just for the for the audience in the room that may not have tried to you know tackle these things before, when I say unstructured data, I really mean Anything that doesn't fit neatly into columns and rows. Um, so, you know, documents, um, images, video, audio, stuff that you can't easily dump into an Excel file. And there's this myth that because it's not easily dumped into an Excel file or a database, you can't get any useful information out of it without a human going through line by line. So, Jeff, how, 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 is, your, how is your thinking evolved on this and, and how do you talk to people about this myth? Well, I, I think with the increase in computer power and algorithms and tools that firms like Hughes have developed, the ability to extract that data has just gone up by leaps and bounds over the last three or four years, right? Um, and and so the what was really hard to do are very, very complicated and you know, I needed defense department computers to do is, is no longer. So you can do it and it's not, you don't need a PhD in unstructured dataology to do it, right? The second yeah. is, is because you figured out how to do that and make reusable models, the cost of doing that has declined significantly, right? And so it's not only can you do it, but you can actually do it at much lower cost and you, with some of the uh, interface, you can do it in a more interactive, as, as I was talking before, you can, basically go and show a screen to the user, hey, I got 95% of this, so we're really confident within these confidence. And these things were not, just go through, click through and say, what is this, is this right? Do, and just so it's it's a whole interactive interface part has also accelerated to, you know, to the point where you and I know the the accuracy levels now for using technology is better than sending it manually to a, a BPO in India and saying, hey, have your people sit in Gurgaon or Hyderabad and read this and put it in our system. We've actually reached that crossover both on cost and on accuracy uh, that you couldn't have said that three years ago. 
So it's no longer yeah, I, I, it's, it's available. Yeah, absolutely. I one of the mistakes we see folks make is that it, they assume that you know you bring in a technology, you completely remove the humans from the process. And the reason humans were there in the first place is because unlike structured data, where you've got the row headers and the column headers, and that tells you exactly what's in there, assuming people are treating the database nicely. Um, you have to bring your own intelligence and your understanding of the content to get what's meaningful out of it. Um, and, you know, with tools that are available today, you really have the, the possibility of capturing that intelligence in a machine learning model without labeling tens of thousands of examples. Um, right. Which brings us to our next myth, which is that extracting unstructured data isn't financially attractive. Um, I think you touched on this a bit, right? There are now technologies that make this scalable, but what else has changed? What busts that myth for you, Jeff? Well, I, I think the main thing is on the value capture side, and this is where you look at different, because extracting the data is only one step, right? What's mm -hmm. developed more is my ability and your ability to take that data and immediately put it into a simple workflow engine that then automates it and puts it into the, various systems, or if we're basically extracting it and we wanna do some semantic analysis on it to basically generate, yeah. let's say the data was a customer email. And I, I can basically get it, use some analysis tools and generate uh, a response back to the customer, uh, could be to a partner, it could be back, okay, we're reading doctor's notes uh, on a patient and we need to basically put that into Epic or Cerner's, um, you know, medical record, yeah. electronic medical records, EMRs. I mean, you can basically, it's the ability not only to be able to extract it, but to very much easily link it to automation and analytics tools like Altrex or other people that you can do stuff to create value because it's there to be actioned by an agent, by an underwriter, by whoever needs to action or, or review it. So it's, it's the combination of technologies because just extracting alone is like, great, I've got a bunch of data that, but it's, and, and I think the great thing we see is the inner, uh, the ability to interact, whether through APIs or other ways of the, of the data, make it a lot more powerful to quickly extract that data and get it to a point where it creates value for a function or a line of, line of business, either through automation or through analytics and all automation. So that's what's changed, as well as the cost side of the equation, which you guys don't want to hear about, which. <laughs> Did we lose you, Jeff? Jeff? Uh, yeah. Oh, there you are. Sorry. You were just going to talk about the cost side of the equation, and then you, uh, you disappeared. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah. So the the cost side is basically uh, because you guys are learning how to use computing power, GPUs more cost effectively, and and basically also as 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 anything, you you scale the cost goes down. So I mean, we've looked at. I mean, your guys are going on unstructured down the same curve that robotics went down over the last five years, where the cost of actually getting a license and doing that. Now, that makes it hard for you guys at Indico because it, it's basically like the Moore's law of intelligent automation. You got to keep improving every year to be more and more more efficient. But that from the CFOs in our audience, that's a very positive trend because it's getting more and more cost effective. And, and as you know, once you set up a, a multi-use platform like Indigo, you, the incremental cost of doing the next use case is also a, a lot lower, right? Um, so, yep. you know, it's a one fixed cost and then the variable cost of doing it over over time comes down, which makes it, as we were talking, e easier to access more use cases. Yeah, the, the analogy with robotics is a great one. Um, it is very much following a, a similar trend. I think one of the complications and part of the reason for this myth is that for a long time, folks were sort of in this mindset where it's either robotics or intelligent document processing. And really mature organizations, what I've seen, it's both. You have a fabric of automation that you can scale across the organization from use case to use case. Sometimes you're more heavily on the robotic side. Sometimes the intelligent document processing is the star of the show, but um, you know, healthy 
uh, mature organizations are really embracing that automation fabric. Um, sort of leads us, you talked about scalability across use cases. Myth number three is that there's sort of a, a real limited number of use cases that are viable when it comes to automating unstructured data-driven processes. Um, I've, I've seen this myth play out in organizations where they say, oh, well, you know, once we get invoices done or once we get loss runs in a, you know, insurance organization done, then we've solved most of the problems. And, you know, a month after they get that one into production, they're saying, you know, we actually have this other document type. Um, and it turns out that one's a big pain too. So I, I wonder what you've seen in this space, Jeff, where that light bulb turns on and, and, and what is it that turns it on for folks? Well, I think what turns it on is experience. And that's what we probably learned from the robotics is early on people said, oh, there are only a handful of things that we could automate, right? Yeah. And then they started thinking about it. And the real key was thinking about it relative to how you're getting the benefits, how much effort you'd put into it, right? But as they got more experienced at looking for it, they saw more, more op opportunities, right? And I think it's, it's interesting when we've worked with clients who start literally going and say, let's just go through, like, let's take in this function, all the documents, like, let's just literally go make a list of all the documents where you do any sort of volume on it and just, and they're, they're continuing to me, maze the, you know, that's why you wonder for companies like Iron Mountain who handle all those documents that businesses still use. Right. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, we're doing to work with the IRS and it's just amazing to me, the, the number and the different types of, you know, I always thought there was one tax form, right? No, there are thousands of different forms, yeah. right? So part of it is, is just, I, it's just experience that if you look at this and you know what to look for and you just start to systematically in, empower your teams. And again, this goes back to our bias that you really need to have it involved with your own internal capabilities because once they're trained and do they have the time to go and say oh yeah and we're handling this, this and this and oh we didn't realize but we do these once every quarter but we do all those and those take a hell of a lot of time or we actually some cases we have to hire 10 people to do that um and, you know which is always a leading indicator of what might be a use case with with documents is hey this is something that peak times of the area we have to use temp workers to, to handle the peaks. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, it, it, by teaching the people about the capability, they look for the use cases. You don't, you don't hire firms like us or Deloitte or Accenture to come in and find use cases. We, we teach you, you know, yeah, we, we show you, the, teach you to fish, to get the fish the first time. And then when the old analogy teach you to fish and you can find a lot of good fishing places that we never thought existed. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, you pointed out one element of this, which is important in there, in that it's a, it's really a cross-functional process of deciding what to automate, right? You know, a lot, a lot of times, you know, folks will stick it with this, the CTO's organization and say, go find stuff to solve. And no one organization really has all of the information necessary to make those good decisions. So you, you have to have some cross-functional discipline to get this done and, and, and choose the right things to automate. Mm -hmm. um, I want to leave some time for questions just in case there's anything from the audience. So I'm going to jump to our fifth myth, which I think is the most important one. I also am not sure it's exactly a myth. So I'll just say it and then I'll say why I'm not so sure. Uh, most intelligent automation initiatives never make it, make it to production. So they never yield benefits. I think... Uh, with the wrong tools and the wrong people involved, that one's actually true. Something like, you know, across, I think it's Gartner published some guidance uh, in recent years where it was something like 12% of, you know, sort of AI or ML initiatives make it to production uh, across enterprises. Um, but, uh, you know, our win rate at Indico is something north of 95%. And so uh, that myth can be busted. Uh, the question is, how do you do it? Well, I, I think, and it may not be never, but sometimes the units, what should be weeks, end up being months is, is the yeah. problem. Um, I, and this is where I think this audience really has a role to play. I think it, the ones that fail is where you don't have business and technology working together yep. 
to achieve a financial outcome, right? Um, you basically need to have, if it's just IT driven, you won't get the business engagement, you won't get the business sign off, you won't get the change management, right? If it's just business, they unfortunately sometimes, as we know, ask for everything, you know, plus icing, plus ice cream, plus a cherry, you know, which just takes takes forever. And you could capture 80% of the value in 20% of the time. And so that's where CFOs play a very important role in managing and overviewing this of saying, okay, how do we break these into sprints if you're an agile shop, you know, to basically, and what, what's the value you get out of the first sprint or the next sprint and do those, those kind of dri outcome driven, um, kind of based on where, where we're getting the benefit, what's the payback ratio kind of programs are highly ahead of the other ones in terms of getting in things production because all everybody's got a skin in the game and making that 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 happen rather than it being and in the key player to be you know the third leg in that stool between IT and the business is is the CFO in most organizations. So yep. Absolutely. Yeah well said. Well said. Marie, I we've got three minutes left. I think we could take one or two questions if you can help us facilitate that. Um, Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, one important part of it here, and I think, Jeff, I appreciate you talking about some of those uh, pitfalls that we do see. I think the, the biggest part is when we're trying to scale automation uh, and we're looking at the different lines of the business, what are the key functions that, you know, you look at in terms of achieving the best benefits uh, to the organization uh, and working through those P&Ls and, or SLAs and, and um, services they're looking for? Well, I think m m most organizations do a, a simple and being a consultant. I, of course, have a, you know, four box matrix kind of thinking of this. One, one is, is who, who's ready to be a change leader, right? Um, and then not um, be just because the management's ready, they may be changing something with a legacy application or something else has changed that says now's not the right time. And the other dimension is the dimension when you think about it that we talk, talk, mentioned earlier, which is in the current environment, where do you really have scarce resources where it's incredibly important to de-bottleneck that for your growth, either de-bottleneck so you can transform costs to go quicker with supply chain constraints, de-bottleneck it so you can have more responses to more customers who are you know, inquiring about you know, what's the rate, what would you charge me? kind of things. And so it's those dimensions that I think people do a quick back of the envelope and say, that's the map of how we think about starting and, and, and where we start to start um, these days, uh, grounded in kind of the, the reality where you are right now. And for every organization, that's a slightly different picture. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think we had one other question that came through the chat, and I think we recognize there is that opportunity or, or there's that risk of fail, failure, right? But I think every failure is an opportunity for learning and improving, uh, and that is the goal with any automation or transformation initiative you're trying to achieve. But the question is more around, um, you know, there was a study that had come up around it takes too long to recognize when it's not working right uh, and to recognize when automation isn't going according to plan. I think it takes an average a year for an executive to figure out if it's failing. Um, what are your thoughts or strategies for how to mitigate it and reduce that timeline from a year to way shorter so that they can set it along the right path? Well, I think part of it is, is people have held that data in different Excel speeds you'll see across a, and sorry, I'll toot our own horn. We have a, a thing called RoboManager, which is an integrated tracking program that allows people to track from opportunity to value captured, how are bots or databases or things like Indico operating real time that, that a CFO can look at to, to do all of that. Um, part of it is not recognizing it because people didn't have the kind of tracking discipline that you have with other programs you, you have. And again, this is a reason why CFOs need to be involved and they need to have the tools to basically say, hey, we've got a bunch of people doing this. We need to know whether it's capturing value. We need to know whether, hey, the, we're paying for this bot, but it's only running a third. We're paying this much 
for Indico, but we're only using this many licenses and we're not doing as much. I mean, that that the tools are being developed by vendors like Indigo and people like us who just do it because that's the way we're we keep track of what we're doing to help clients. Um, but it's a very important issue, as you point out, Marie, because if you don't recognize it, the businesses get frustrated very, very, very quickly to say this isn't what we we asked for. So, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I want to thank both you and Chris for, for taking the time to demystify some of those myths and concepts that we have out there as we continue uh, the conversations in our next chat on, on scaling uh, and our automation journeys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot.